get him in for your team and talk to you. It's one of the best speeches I've ever seen. It blew my socks off. He's, um, he's been top brass at Saatchi's, uh, uh, all of the top firms. He's amazing. I I'm not going to make any effort to introduce him because he does it himself. Uh, can I just have a big round of applause for Mr. Peter Bracegirdle? Uh, see, it wasn't even talking about. It's just, just stop people trying to say something. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, it, um, it's been a great day, um, and I, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, uh, I'm Pete Bracegirdle. I've um, basically, I've, I've, I mean, I've, I'm the co founder of an advertising agency now uh, called Creative Coalition, but most of my career um, I've worked in kind of big global ad agencies in the UK in New Zealand for five years and uh, for about eight or nine years in America. So sort of working on sort of big brands, um, you know, Nike, Adidas, PlayStation, Nissan, Twitter, things like that. Um, uh, and th the story today I'm going to share with you is about, um, that, that happened during my time in New Zealand. Um, so it's a while ago. Um, and it's about the partnership between Adidas and the New Zealand All Blacks, um, and how they came together and did some interesting things. Um, and what it teaches us about the value of interesting, okay? Um, and as we go through this, um, I suspect that a lot of what I'm going to say, you're going to go, yeah. Like, it's not, this is not going to be one of those speeches where you go, wow, I did not know that. Okay? But I hope it is one of those speeches where you go, you know what? I kind of don't pay enough attention to that. Okay? So, um, before we get into that story, I'm just going to set some context, uh, set a scene, if you, if you like. Um, because I want to talk a little bit about why interesting is important, right? And then um, why it's important and why I think we need to pay more attention to it. And then along the way, we'll pick up on some shifts in thinking, which I think we can all make to help make our communications more effective. And, and when I'm talking about communications, some of my examples and stuff may feel like big things or advertising things, but I think it applies to every type of marketing communications, right? So the principles, um, I think, are, are sound. So. Lots of things change. So that's my first profound slide. Um, I've been doing this a long time. And, and our industry is absolutely obsessed with what is new, right? We're all constantly focused on, um, you know, new trends, uh, new devices, new materials, um, new technologies. Um, and in fact, the, the tools and materials with which we do what we do in terms of making marketing communications uh, are constantly changing, right? And never more so than now, right? It's sort of terrifying how fast everything's moving now, okay? So it's kind of understandable, I think, um, that we all get fixated on trying to find competitive advantage, trying to make our stuff good in the new. Like we're looking for the new to find ways to make things better. And that's all well and good, and I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't stay abreast of all this stuff, and you shouldn't look for opportunities there. But, so lots of things change, but this doesn't, right? This is your solid ground. I'm gonna argue that this actually is kind of profound in the sense that this is actually something which is about humanity and about how we interact with all sorts of things. And, and you can, if you stick to this thought and simplify it down to this, okay, you will not go far wrong 
in marketing communication. So this guy, Howard Gossage, he wrote this in the 50s. Right? This is a long time ago. Nobody reads advertising. People read what interests them, and sometimes it's an ad. Right? Now, I'd argue that is absolutely true today as it was then. I'd also argue that I could replace the word advertising with marketing. Nobody reads marketing. People read what interests them, and sometimes it's marketing. Okay? So fundamentally, right, we're not in the business of telling people what we want them to know. We're in the business of being interesting. Right? That's the business you're all in. Okay? And so when Sonia said, and she's absolutely right, and the book's brilliant, by the way, but when she said, help, don't sell, she's really saying, like, we're in the business of doing something for them, doing something that's interesting to them and valuable to them, not what you think is valuable to you. Right? And that's the difficult and counterintuitive bit. Right? But, so, nobody reads advertising. People read what interests them. And sometimes it's an ad. I want to keep going with the retro references. Um, Bill Burnback also said this in the 50s. Um, the truth isn't the truth until people believe you. And they can't believe you if they don't know what you're saying. And they can't know what you're saying if they don't listen to you. And they won't listen to you if you're not interesting. And you won't be interesting unless you say things imaginatively, originally, and freshly. Now, Bill Birnbach, he's the B from DDB, absolute legend. Okay, I, And I would take this moment to say, if you have a moment, Google check out his resignation letter from 1947. It's absolute genius. And I would argue it's this most kind of like prescient warning for modern agencies, you wouldn't believe how true what he's worried about is true today, right? And it's kind of making my broader point. Lots of things change, but we're in the business of something which is basically about humanity, and we're not changing. So making it work for humans is, isn't going to change. Now, so what Bill's saying here, he's saying... Yes, you've got to be interesting, or else no one's going to pay attention to you. No one's going to listen to what you say. No one's going to remember what you, you, try, you want them to believe. But to be interesting, you've got to be creative. You've got to be different and original and imaginative. So if this talk is about anything, it's about a plea for creativity, right? And to value creativity. Because actually, that is the thing which makes everything work in our business. And that's just not an undeniable human truth. It's also backed up by the data. So the empirical evidence is absolutely categoric on this issue. OK? Um, highly creative campaigns are 12 times more effective than less creative campaigns. Now, I could have chosen any number of different studies, um, and they're all pretty much saying the same thing. Sometimes that number's 10, sometimes it's 8. Doesn't matter. In a world where we're fighting after little increments, that is ridiculous orders of magnitude changes in effectiveness. So, in all of the things that we have to worry about to make our marketing communications work, the single most important thing is whether our work, the content, is creative, original, different, imaginative, interesting. That's where the value is. That's where we should be putting our resources, and that's where we should be putting our effort. So the equation is kind of simple. If we can make it more creative, it'll be more interesting. If it's more interesting, it'll be more effective. And it's more effective because if it's more interesting, I'm more likely to notice you because it's interesting, right? I'm more likely to remember you because it was interesting. 
more likely to be able to differentiate you, more likely to build affinity with you because you've interested me, more likely to prefer you, more likely to choose you, more likely to advocate on your behalf. So if you think about your funnel, at every point in that funnel, by being more interesting to your audience, by being more creative in the way that you do it and being more interesting, you are creating more effectiveness. Um, I've chosen that McDonald's sign there as a little quick example. Um, it was that's actually done by my, my creative partner, Guy Moore, and when he was working in Toronto. So I guess it's a plug for Guy. Um, but it's a brilliant piece of design, right? It's a brilliant idea, right? So I'm going to put a sign to tell you where to get to McDonald's, but he does it in such a creative way, such a simple and brilliant piece of design, that of course you're going to notice that sign. Of course you're going to remember it. You're probably going to think that McDonald's are quite cool because they've done something clever, right? So a very simple thing has suddenly changed the effectiveness of that. And that is because he took the care to try and think of, a, they've asked me for a sign, I could just do a sign. You know what? Let's really do something that hasn't been done as interesting. Now, creativity is clearly important, and I know you all know this. Um, but the reason I think it's worth passionately reminding ourselves about this is because the truth is that most of the stuff in the world, most of marketing communications, just isn't very interesting, right? So 17 million UK households right, pay Netflix to avoid watching ads. Think about that. I'm going to give you 11 quid a month. Just don't show me the advertising, okay? Now, that is a pretty sad indictment about how interesting UK advertising is. It's like, really, it's that bad? Holy, you know, we've got an uphill struggle. People really don't want to watch our stuff. Like we talk about kind of an attention economy and like, how do I possibly get in front of people? And they are actively trying to avoid you. They are paying good money. I mean, that's not a bad night out and they'd rather do that to avoid watching your ads. Very few people are going to open up a marketing email. And almost nobody is going to click a banner, a display ad, to find out what's behind it. No one thinks anything's interesting behind that. No one. So, we need to shift our thinking. Because most of what happens in the marketing communications world is just not interesting enough. But more than that, because of that, it's a brilliant opportunity. Right? So if you can make your communications 12 times more effective than everybody else's, just by putting a bit more effort into the originality and imagination of the content, right? what about that? Now that's where your competitive advantage is. So we need to shift our thinking. Um, now, quick anecdote, if I may. Because um, I do think I need to explain why I've put a box, an enormous Amazon box, on the back of a truck. It's a pretty random slide. And uh, I was thinking about just brushing over it, but I think I better tell you what it, why it's there. So um, when you're, uh, I, I, one of my previous jobs, I was in America, um, and I ran the Nissan business for North America. So, you, you know, lots of car advertising, okay? Um, and we were launching a new car. Um, and what comes with that is, you know, an enormous amount of money to spend on car advertising. Right? And so you, you're making ads and you're making all the bits and pieces that go around. Um, so we were doing all that stuff. But we were also asking ourselves, can, can we just, is there anything more interesting we can do? And so um, someone brilliant had this idea. Was, what, if we, um, what if we tried to be the first brand to sell a car on Amazon? Would that be interesting? And so well, that sounds interesting. That hasn't been done before. Right? It's not talking about the car at all necessarily, it just feels like quite an interesting thing to do. So we worked with Amazon, we figured out how to do it, we built the, the page, and you could, so you could actually go onto the page and you could get the specifications of the car you wanted, and you could order it. And then we thought, you know what, for, for a few people, let, wouldn't it be fun, we'll deliver it in a massive box, right? Just because, I don't know, 
It's kind of fun, right? It sounded like a cool idea. There wasn't really any justification. And what's funny about this is, like, we were spending, like, literally millions of dollars over here on the stuff that everyone really cared about within the client, right? So I'm going to research the hell out of everything you do over here. This was like, oh, whatever. I don't know. Well, okay, fine. Like, it doesn't cost much money. Just go and do that. Um, so, so we did this. And this picture was taken by some bloke, I don't know who he was, out of a window in Minneapolis. So the bloke who bought this car um, lived in Minnesota somewhere. And um, the truck was on its way to his house to deliver the truck. Now this guy took this picture because he's like, what is in the box? So he put it on Reddit and goes, what's in the box? And of course, that's exactly the kind of thing that Reddit loves, right? So Reddit went absolutely bonkers for this. And suddenly it's trending on Reddit. And suddenly it's trending all over the internet. And suddenly we've got millions and millions of dollars of free PR where the whole, you know, the whole internet's going, what's in the box? Right? There was, honestly, there was Brad Pitt memes, you know, from, you know, what's in the box? Um, so it's like, I, I mention it because we did it just because it was interesting. And people loved it because it was interesting, it ended up being our most successful launch, because we'd kind of, the paid campaign kind of amplified the earned attention. And I'll come on to that in a second. So, we need to shift our thinking. Um, the first thing I'd say is, let's shift our thinking from the expected and the conventional. And please forgive me, from best practice. Okay? And let's start focusing our attention on not trying to stay within the comfort of this is how it's done. This is the right way to do it. Everyone knows how. Well, let, these are the rules. Our business is full of people, and I understand this is not a criticism, who are codifying why things worked. right? And they'll tell you all the time, these are the best practices. Here's a case study. Here's the five reasons that's a good thing. Let's all do that. Now, the problem with that the counterintuitive, paradoxical problem with that is, if everyone's trying to do the right thing in the same way, because they've all learnt the same lessons, then they all end up doing the same thing in the same way. And, and so suddenly, everything looks the same. And if it looks the same, it's, it's, you know, it's the enemy of cut through, it's the enemy of distinctiveness, it's the enemy of memorability, and you're, just, you're actually wasting your money. So the hardest conversation to have is go, Doing something original and different and imaginative that hasn't been done before is always described as risky, right? Now, I'd argue the one thing I know is not going to work is doing something just like everybody else's or in exactly the same way. So by following the best practices and following all the, I'm doing it the right way, that's how you sell cars, right? That's the right way to sell insurance. That's how it's done. Okay, you're actually definitely wasting your money. Okay, so my encouragement is be original, be different, be imaginative, and don't be apologetic about the value of creativity, right? And push against the tide of people who'll be telling you, oh, it's not how it's done, you need to do it that way, they're the best practice. Okay, so the second encouragement. I would give you is when you when we're briefing work, um, we often go through that process of okay, what do we want people to know? What do we want people to think? What do we want people to do? In fact, lots of quite sensible agencies have briefs which literally have those things down the left hand side, right? Now, of course, ultimately, that's what we want to happen. We want to change people's minds on a brand. We want to change their behavior. But the danger is, if you tell the consumers what you want them to know, right, and you tell them what you want them to think, that's not very interesting. So, you know, if I'm an insurance brand, I say, well, if, if only they knew these five reasons why our car insurance is better than the other person's car insurance, right? They all come and buy our car insurance, right? And all of these brands are constantly shocked that people aren't sitting around waiting to know five things about your car insurance. It's not interesting. Okay? So, what I'd encourage you to do, exactly what Sonia was talking about, is 
start by thinking, what's interesting to them? What are they interested in? How can I be valuable to them? How can I be useful? How can I be entertaining? How can I contribute to what they care about? So if you can contribute to what they care about, that's interesting to them. They'll appreciate it. They'll definitely remember you've done it. They'll almost certainly value your brand more because you've done something that they think is valuable and interesting. Okay? So try and resist the temptation to start with a transmission of things that you want them to know. Okay? Because it just isn't very interesting, unfortunately. Here's an unreliable clicker, to be fair. There we go. Okay. Um, the, the, the third point, and then I'll get on to the AVS bit. Um, paid amplified by earned, right? So that, that's kind of how we all think, right? Can I go, I've got my paid budget, and I've got to make sure that that stuff's bang on because we're paying money for people to see that. I'm going to pay to interrupt people with that, so I better make sure we tell them all the things we want them to know. I'm going to really craft the, you know, the three or four things they have to know about me and I'm going to put it in the pay campaign because they've got to really know about that. Right? And then we hope that maybe people share it and we hope that people, maybe media people talk about it. So we'll kind of go paid and maybe we'll amplify with a bit of social, right? a bit of PR. Right? That, uh, and I am absolutely part of the problem here. This is, you know, most of my career, that would be the conversation. So my challenge is, it's if we give ourselves the challenge of saying, actually, I'm making some content for, and it's going to have some paid budget behind it, but I'm going to treat it like there isn't a paid budget. What I mean by that is it's got to earn its attention. It's got to be interesting enough that people want to engage with it and consume it and watch it and read it and everything else. And don't hide behind the fact that, don't worry, We've got loads of money and 60% of our audience are going to see it, so we're all good. Well, not really, because they're not going to read it and they're not going to care. Right? So focus on being interesting, earning the attention, and then put your money behind it, and guess what? It works so much better. So, Adidas and the All Blacks. So this story, um, as I said, I was working in New Zealand at the time, and uh, one of our clients was Adidas, and they just sponsored the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team. Now, so Adidas did this because basically they were trying to build credibility in the rugby, rugby market globally. Obviously, the All Blacks was a fantastic property. Um, and they were also hoping to, you know, so they're going to sell loads more shoes and loads more sportswear to rugby fans. That was the plan. And they were also hoping that, you know, by sponsoring the All Blacks, that New Zealand would, you know, everyone in New Zealand would buy their stuff. So that all makes sense, right? Um, th there was a problem, though, because in New Zealand, the deal was really unpopular. Because um, Adidas had outbid Canterbury, which is a New Zealand rugby brand. And they'd been the All Blacks brand for, like, donkey's years, right? So everyone was pretty sceptical. How could this German football brand know anything about rugby? And how could they possibly understand what this team means to us as a country? And if you know anything about rugby, the relationship between the All Blacks and the New Zealand population is extraordinary. Okay? They are, their self-belief and self-esteem are completely entwined. Right? They represent the nation in such a deep and meaningful way. So this isn't just another sports team. So when we, when we had this challenge, we were kind of like, okay, we've got, we've got a really, really weak brand situation, really unpopular brand. How are we going to deal with that and turn that around? So we start by thinking about how sponsorship works. So basically, this is what sponsorship does, right? So me, the brand, am going to pay you money, the property, the team, the event, and I'm going to attach myself to you, right? And I'm going to get some exposure. That's great. But more than that, I'm going to get this value exchange, right? So the things that is popular about you, some of that is going to rub off on me. So Coca-Cola are kind of like, we're going to be at the World Cup, 
because, yeah, lots of people will see us, but more important than that, people really love football. And that we kind of hope that they'll kind of like Coca-Cola a bit more because we kind of like football too, right? And that's how sponsorship is sold to brands, right? So the World Cup will tell people this. They'll tell Coke that. Okay? So that's how sponsorship works. So, so it's basically extracting value. I'll give you money, and I will extract value from your property. So the conventional approach to what we would uh, offered with Adidas and All Blacks was, okay, how can we extract value from the All Blacks band to make people like Adidas more? Okay? Um, but we asked ourselves a different question. So we said, what if we don't extract value? What if we added value? What if instead of trying to say, hey, proud sponsors of the All Blacks, like us, right, we actually did something that would be appreciated and valued by, um, by the country and by the team. Now, at the time this happened, um, this was about to happen, right? So the British and Irish Lions were coming over on tour. And when the Lions come on tour, you know, this is what happens, right? So they are very colorful and they are very loud and mostly drunk. And there was 20,000 of them, and they were coming, right? And the team and the captain, so Richard McCaw's captain at the time, uh, he was generally worried. And he was worried because Kiwis are very understated people. When they're in a stadium, they typically did not sing. They did not wear colors. And so what, what Richie was worried about was this lot would turn up and he'd step out onto the pitch and it would feel like an away fixture. They would lose the advantage of the home, you know, the home advantage because all the noise and all the colour was coming from the away supporters. So we thought, well, that's interesting. Is that an opportunity for us to help in some small way? So the solution we came up with um, was very simple. We said, you know what? We're going to try and get the New Zealand people, we're going to ask them to stand in black, to turn up to games and just wear black. That's it. We're not going to talk about Adidas. We're not going to talk about the products. We're just going to encourage them to turn up to the games and wear black. That's it. And so what we did, we kind of started it with a kind of a teaser campaign. Uh, we created this sort of Huckerman symbol, this sort of silhouette, and we plastered them all over the country for three weeks with no explanation. So, you know, up here is on Canterbury Plains as you fly into Christchurch. You'd see that going, what is that? You know, a statue um, sort of in the entrance to Auckland Harbour. Um, fly post stickers everywhere. Um, three weeks, just silhouettes. And then at the end of the three weeks, the team, not Adidas, the team announced... Um, what it was all about. He goes, we'd like your help. We'd like you to turn up and just wear black. Help us out. The lines are coming. It would mean a lot to us. And, of course, the whole country went, of course we will. Great idea. I want to help. I want to help my team. And everyone got behind it. And everyone wore black. Now, of course, after that announcement, we then went out there with the rest of the campaign, which, you know, had, had the Huckerman man stand in black. Pretty simple, just a, just a request, but it attached Adidas to it. Now, at this point, we haven't said anything about Adidas, and we aren't going to, right? We're just kind of sponsoring this act of benevolence from the fans, is basically what we're doing, okay? So, so this is what happened. So, every single person, pretty much, turned up in black. And, and if you were there on the day, it was pretty extraordinary. Because you looked around the same and it was like absolutely black, then red, and then black. And it's like, and suddenly, the team were like, hang on, this is different. You've changed the atmosphere. And everyone in the crowd felt the difference as well. They're like, hang on, we're all together. Like, we've got their backs. And so, what happened is, by being, by focusing what was valuable to the team, and what's valuable to the client, if you like, sorry, valuable to the team, um, 
and making a contribution to what they cared about, right? The fans really appreciated it, right? So suddenly, they really respected what LAS had done. Um, and it changed the dynamics. So suddenly, everyone thought, no, Adidas is a great sponsor of the All Blacks. Right? Good for them. They're helping us. Thank you, Adidas. So the brand metrics went crazy. Sales soared. And we hadn't talked about a single thing about Adidas at all. We'd done something that they appreciated. Um, and above all else, was interesting. Right? Wouldn't it be interesting if we all went there and stood in black? So that was the first thing we did. Um, so that went well, and we went, okay, what next? Now, New Zealand Rugby Union, <coughs> excuse me, every year produce a poster. It's a team poster, just a picture of the team, and, and all the kids um, in New Zealand get a poster and they put it on the wall, right? Pretty standard stuff. It, they'd done it for years. Uh, nothing particularly extraordinary about that. Um, but we were now given the opportunity to do the next poster. Okay, so we're kind of like, okay, well, how do we make that more interesting? So what do those young fans really want? What's important to them? What's valuable to those young fans? What they really want is to get close to their heroes. Right? That's what fandom is about. You just want to get connected and feel close to them. That's what they wanted. So our idea was, okay, we're going to take blood from every single member of the squad. We're going to mix that blood with the ink that we then print the posters with. Okay? So we called the poster Bonded by Blood. And when kids got their poster, it came with a little certificate that, guaranteed, that told them that their poster had the DNA of all of their teammates, of all their team in there. And then they could hang that on their wall. So a simple thing didn't cost much money, but it made that poster much, much, much more interesting, much, much, much more valuable. And in fact, so valuable that those posters, years later, were going on eBay for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Okay? So a simple idea, by being imaginative about it, um, we created something more interesting and much more effective. Now, of course, obviously, sales went up. This actually won a Grand Prix at Cannes for the best promotional idea in the year globally. Um, and Saw 3, let's claim fame, Saw 3, the, uh, the movie franchise, they, they copied the idea and they put the blood of the actor in, the, in their movie posters. Um, they, they, did, they did credit us for that. Um, so, a really interesting, unique idea. Sales going crazy, brand strength's getting stronger. What next? So later that year was the uh, 2007 World Cup, World Cup in, uh, in France. So, okay, what are we going to do for that? Now, um, the soil in Maori culture is incredibly culturally important, right? So when they do the haka at the, before every game, basically what they're doing is they are summoning up energy and strength from their ancestors from beneath the earth, right? That's what the Maoris believe. And so the soil and the soil of New Zealand is kind of sacred to them. Um, and the team was flying off to France. And so the idea we had was, I tell you what, why don't we go to every ground where every All Black has ever played? So, the, so there have been about, I think, 1,071 people who had ever played the All Blacks at this point. And we identified all of the pitches where they'd first started playing, right, as, as kids. So all of the clubs, little clubs around, around New Zealand. And we went to each of them, and we dug up a little bit of earth. We took a little bit of uh, soil, and we collected it and put it in a canister. And we mixed all that soil together, and we built these beautiful design canisters, and we put them in point of sale and things like that. But then we took those canisters to France, and we gave them to Richie McCall. So at every game in the 2007 World Cup, when he went out for the captain's run onto the pitch, he took a little canister full of soil, home soil in a, you know, in a foreign land. 
So he spread a little bit of New Zealand on that pitch. Kind of like, interesting idea. Again, we're not saying anything particularly about Adidas at all, um, except that we kind of care and we understand. And we understand what's important to you and we understand what's important to your culture. And we're not just a German football brand. We kind of get it, right? We get what being a, an All Blacks fan and we understand Maori culture and we're sensitive to those things. So, um, now, we had that idea. That's the kind of earned bit. Um, and we also did an advertising campaign, but that was about amplifying that basic idea. The idea was already really interesting, and people wanted to talk about that, and people wanted to report about it on the news and all that. And the advertising just reminded people about that good idea. And the point of sale just reminded people about that idea. And then a year after that, so this is a, the last example um, from this batch. Um, so people had appreciated getting closer to the team um, with the Bonded by Blood poster. Um, and, you know, we wanted to find another way of creating that connectivity. Um, so this idea was um, we invited people to sign up to a website created a website, invited them to sign up in support of the team. And everyone who signed up, their name would be inscribed using unbelievable nanotechnology onto a single thread, a single thread, which would then be sewn into the shirt that the captain wore. So the, the fern on the All Blacks, one of the threads had... 100,000 names on it, okay? So a piece of thread, long piece of thread, 100,000 names were inscribed on it using some crazy technology which I never understood, okay? But they managed to do it. Now, what that was is, is kind of like symbolically, I'm looking at Richie McCaw playing, I idolise this man, and my name's here, like right above his heart, in that badge, my name, and all those other people a collective sense of support. But it also gave me that opportunity as a fan to kind of be involved and to be part of something, to be part of something interesting. It's just an interesting idea. Is it possible? How do you put, how, how do you put 100,000 names on a thread? That's interesting. My name on his shirt, that's interesting. Nothing to do with boots and equipment, just interesting. I want to be involved in that. I want to hear about it. I want you to talk about it. I want to hear it on the news. I'm going to read about it. That's interesting. So all of these four campaigns over a period of four or five years transformed what was a really, really dodgy, shaky start for Adidas into an unbelievably strong relationship with the whole population of New Zealand. Right? So everyone in New Zealand really, really believed and, and, and respected um, the Adidas band. They really, they really, really believed that Adidas cared about what they cared about and that would help them and do something that was important and valuable to them. And everything we'd done, we'd done it in an interesting way. So all of the marketing communications were massively amplified by all the PR and the news that everyone got behind. Because if people are interested in it, then the news is going to be interested in it. That's what, that's what their job is. Report on what's interesting, right? So if you do something interesting, the PR is more likely to write about you and talk about you. That's interesting. That's a good story, right? That's how they work. So we'd completely amplified the marketing expenditure. We created this incredibly deep bond with the audience, right? We'd shown our respect. And of course, they appreciated it. And they, re they replied, and they responded by preferring our brand, valuing our brand, appreciating the brand, buying our products advocating for us, being loyal, and so on. So all of our marketing objectives were achieved massively um, by being interesting. And we had to be creative to be interesting because going back to what Bill said, you can't be interesting if you're not original and imaginative because doing stuff which has been done before, doing stuff I've kind of seen before, 
That's not interesting. I'm not going to pay attention to that. So I guess I'd encourage you, in all your endeavors, in whatever channels you work in, um, to spend a disproportionate amount of time that's more, you know, frankly, um, that is more in keeping with the value, right, and really focus on how important it is to do something different and be original and do something that's not the same as what everyone else in your category is doing and try and think of fun and involving ideas. And if they're interesting, right, and relevant, but don't necessarily say much about your brand, that's okay. That may even be a great thing, right? But focus on what's interesting to your audience and give them that because that they will then repay you in massive kind. That's it. Thank you.